I think people will find this story particularly interesting. It's one of the lesser known stories that came out of the 1916 Rising. It's about a woman called Muriel McDonough. She was the wife of Thomas McDonough, who was shot dead in Kilmainham in 1916. And this is her story a year later, when she drowned in Skerries. It's something that a lot of people know very little about. In early July 1917, a large house in Skerries, County Dublin, was rented by the National Aid Association to provide short holiday breaks for widows and relatives of the 1916 leaders, Muriel McDonough, her sister Grace Plunkett and Lily, widow of James Connolly, were among those who availed of the welcome vacation. All three women had lost their husbands who were executed by firing squad in Kilmainham Jail following the 1916 Easter Rising. The tragic story of Grace Plunkett, Nee Gifford, is recorded in a much-loved song called Grace, how she married Joseph Plunkett just hours before he was taken out and shot. And my story today is about Muriel McDonough, Nee Gifford, the sister of Grace Gifford. Muriel was one of five daughters of a Catholic family and a Church of Ireland mother. Her parents were unionists to the core. Her seven brothers had somewhat more liberal leanings but stopped well short of supporting Irish nationalism. All five of the Gifford sisters were raised in the Protestant tradition of their mother, but four of them eventually converted to Catholicism and all five became fervent nationalists. Thomas McDonough met Muriel Gifford seven years as junior in 1910. Two years earlier, in 1908, he had been appointed assistant principal of Porrick Pierce's school, Aina. Muriel's unionist parents strongly disapproved of the Catholic Republican McDonough, but despite family objections on both sides, the couple were married on January the 3rd, 1912. Apart from the priest and the wedding couple, only two witnesses, the bridesmaid and the best man, were invited to the ceremony. Porrig Pierce had been asked to stand in as McDonough's best man. But whether he forgot the exact time of the ceremony, or because of his somewhat absent-minded nature, Pierce failed to turn up. In despair, the priest exited the church, spotted a man clipping a hedge nearby and invited him into the church where he duly acted as witness instead of Pierce. Almost 11 months later, on November the 22nd, 1912, the McDonough's firstborn child, Donna, was being christened in the same church. Pierce had not been asked to attend this time, but he turned up anyway. McDonough is supposed to have retorted, Well, Pierce, you may have missed the wedding, but at least you turned up in time for the christening. A second child, Barbara, was born to the happily married couple in 1915. But their happiness was to be short-lived. The following year, 1916, Thomas McDonough acted as commander-in-chief in Dublin's Jacobs factory during the Easter Rising. The building suffered relatively little damage during the Rising, but news of the surrender reached McDonough on Saturday the 29th of April. He surrendered the following day. The news of his arrest must have been heartbreaking to Muriel. On May the 2nd, Thomas McDonough, along with Porrick Pierce and Tom Clark, were sentenced to death. The sentence to be carried out at dawn on the following morning. McDonough's thoughts at the end or of his stricken wife. He longed to see and to speak with her. He would give anything, he said, to see Muriel once more. Tragically, that was not to be. According to historian Ray Bateson, arrangements were made for a military car to arrive at Oakley Road to convey Muriel to Kilmainham Jail. But due to sniper activity in the city, the car failed to reach its destination. Another account by Geraldine Plunkett, sister of the 1916 hero Joseph Plunkett, states that when Muriel was refused a pass to visit her husband, she attempted to walk the three-hour journey by foot to Kilmainham, only to be stopped at all the military cordons. Thomas McDonough went to his death 
without the consolation of speaking in his last hours to the woman he loved. The tragedy of her husband, and above all the fact that she was unable to see him on the eve of his execution, weighed terribly on the mind of Muriel McDonough. She was utterly devastated, suffered bouts of chronic illness, nervous disorder and acute depression. She was also left penniless with two children to bring up. On May the 3rd, 1917, the anniversary of her husband's death, Muriel converted to Catholicism. In the immediate aftermath of the Easter Rising, Kathleen Clark, that would have been Thomas Clark's widow, with the assistance of members of Cumann the Mon, established the Irish Republican Prisoners Dependents Fund to support the families of those killed or imprisoned. They mounted an appeal for funds in various newspapers. The advertisements were refused by the censor, on the grounds that the title of the organisation included the word Republican, which was deemed to be offensive. To address this problem, the name of the organisation was changed to the Irish Volunteer Dependents Fund. In May 1917, the Irish Parliamentary Party set up a fund with similar objectives called the Irish National Aid Fund. The two organisations later merged to form the Irish National Aid and Volunteers Dependent Fund. This organisation ensured a steady stream of funds to families of the executed leaders. Muriel McDonough was given £250. Despite this assistance, Muriel had to move the family from Oakley Road to a flat at Marlborough Road in Donnybrook. Her mother, Isabella, once visited to give her £5. Isabella commented on how Thomas had left the family destitute. Muriel handed the money back and told her mother she wasn't going to accept her charity if she was bad mouthing her husband at the same time. In early 1917, Muriel took her two children to sit for photographs at Switzer's department store in the city centre. The photographs were to be used by the National Aid Association as part of a pamphlet to raise money for the dependence of the, of the rising leaders and those imprisoned. As Muriel and baby Barbara were being photographed, little Dunna wandered off. As he did so, he fell down several flights of stairs and injured his back in several places. In July 1917, the National Aid Association had rented this house in Skerries for the use of relatives of the rising leaders for a short holiday. Dunna had still not recovered from his bad fall and Muriel was reluctant to leave her four-year-old on his own in hospital. However, her sister Grace, the widow of Joseph Plunkett, persuaded her to go to Skerries for the break, saying she, could not, she would not go unless Muriel did too. Muriel reluctantly agreed and asked two Capuchin priests, Father Albert and Father Aloysius, to check in on Little Dunna from time to time. Gerald Shannon, a historian residing in Skerries, wrote an excellent paper for Irish History in July of 2016 describing the death of Muriel McDonough. I'm drawing here from that paper for the following information. On the trip to Skerries that July, the group included Muriel, her two-year-old daughter Barbara, Muriel's sister Grace, that was Joe Plunkett's widow, Lily Connolly, that was James Connolly's widow, and her three children, Anya Kant, that was Eamon Kant's widow, and her son, Agnes Mallon, that was Michael Mallon's widow, and her five children. It was also said in a later recollection that one of Pierce's sisters was also present. They all stayed in a large holiday home called Miramar, which was located at 41 Strand Street in Scurries. Though Muriel enjoyed the new surroundings and good weather, her thoughts were very much fixed on her absent little son, Dunna. She kept up a flurry of postcards to the recovering Dunna. Dearest Don, this is a lovely place. Babily came to meet me at the station with Aunt Grace. Babily was in the sea today. Babily is getting quite brown. I have a lovely surprise for you when I come home. Babily is having a lovely time getting dipped in the sea. Intriguingly, one card postmarked the 8th of July stated, Dearest Don, 
I had a lovely big swim today and nearly got over to the island. I'd have some lovely seaweed and seashells when we get back. Several days into the holiday, on Monday, July the 19th, 1917, the party of women and children assembled on the South Strand Beach in glorious weather. Directly across from them, less than a kilometre away, was Shenick Island with its Martello Tower. Muriel and Grace took little Barbara around the beach to collect shells, which Muriel placed in a cosmetic box for her daughter. One well-known account that has held sway to the, over the century since suggests that Muriel wanted to raise the tricolour flag over the Martello Tower on Shenick Island. Decades later, Grace told a family member that the idea had come about when there had been a lot of Union Jacks flying along the beach and the Nationalist families had put a tricolour flag uh, along the, uh, beside their tent that they were using. Two men of the RIC arrived on the scene and ordered them to take down their tricolour. When they left, Muriel told the group, I'll put that flag where they can't get it. It should, however, be noted that the story of raising the flag was never reported at the later inquest, nor in newspaper accounts of the time. No tricolour flag was ever reported to have been found near Muriel's body. One other suggestion was that she had a bathing cap in the colours of a tricolour, but that's only conjecture. Another version of what possibly happened was that Muriel may not even have set her mind on swimming all the way to the island. A recorded exchange between Muriel and Ina Connolly claimed that when Muriel asked Ina to look after her daughter Barbara, Ina jokingly replied, I will not look after Barbara unless you promise not to swim to the island. Muriel smiled and promised she wouldn't. Whatever the truth, as Muriel swam towards the island, she was pulled out by the strong current crossing in front of Shenick Island. Ina Connolly would recall at the inquest that the crowd on the beach, herself included, called out for Muriel to return. While Muriel waved back to indicate she was fine, it soon became clear that she was in some sort of distress. Her sister Grace would recall saying to the group, My goodness, she's an awful distance out. Moments later, Muriel disappeared under the water. Pandemonium immediately set in among the group on the beach. A screaming Barbara, having witnessed her mother disappear, was removed from the scene into a nearby house. Grace and several men ran to another nearby house to commandeer a boat to head out towards the island. At the house in question, they were refused the oars by a servant. At a later inquest, an RIC constable, John Burke, said that the homeowner, one John Griffith and his family were not in the house at the time and the servant said that she had not understood what the lady wanted to use the hours for. The servant also informed the constable that a lady wearing a soldier's badge like coming man asked for the hours but she was again refused. Grace said at the inquest she did not feel the hours were refused because of ignorance. A rowing boat eventually set out in the direction of Shenick Island, commandeered by Noel Lamas, a young volunteer and brother of future Taoiseach Sean Lamas. He was then recovering from his wounds after suffering uh, them at Easter week. An off-duty British officer accompanied Lamas. In October 1923, the body of Noel Lamas, on a different matter, it was found in a mutilated and tortured condition on the Featherbed Mountain in County Dublin. An inquest into Noel Lamas's death later found that the armed forces of the state had been implicated in Lamas's removal and disappearance. But back to my story. After other boats and search parties set out, Muriel's body was eventually found at around 7.30am the following morning, about a quarter of a mile away from where she was last seen. It would be an old friend of her husband, Commandant Rory O'Connor of the Irish Volunteers, who later arrived in Scarries and identified her body. 
Muriel McDonough's funeral mass was celebrated on July the 11th, 1917, in the pro-cathedral, and she was buried in the Republican plot in Glasnevin. Her death left her two children orphaned. The little box of seashells were treasured for many years by Muriel's daughter, Barbara, and they were eventually donated to, to Kilmainham Jail, to the museum, where he can still be seen there. Grace Gifford, Plunkett, she went on to have an active and a successful life as an artist and a cartoonist, and she died in 1955.